So welcome to the C3AI Digital Transformation Institute Colloquium Series. Our mission is to attract the world's leading scientists to join in a coordinated and innovative effort to advance the digital transformation of business, government, and society. And we are a consortium of several different universities and uh, we're supported by C3AI. The upcoming events are a talk on December 3rd about bringing social distancing to light and a talk on December 10th, housing precarity, eviction and inequality due to COVID-19. And today we will have the next of our colloquium talks. Uh, the format today is as with the others, there's a 40 minute presentation, then there's time for Q&A. For during the Q&A, what you should be doing is putting your questions into the Q&A box. And if you see a question that you like, you can upvote it. Uh, we will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the talk. There will not be a break in this talk for Q&A. Our talk today is by three different people. And the title is Tracking the Few and Far Between Computational Strategies to Speed the Discovery of Low Frequency Genomic Variation in COVID-19. The three speakers are Nancy Amato, who is the head of computer science here at the University of Illinois. She got her degrees from Stanford and Berkeley and the University of Illinois. She's worked for many years in robotics, but also in computational biology and parallel computing. The fellow of the AAAI, AAAS, ACM, and IEEE. Lawrence Rauschwerger is also one of the speakers today. He's a professor in the Department of Computer Science. Also with Nancy, he came from Texas A&M where he was the Upright Professor of Computer Science and Engineering. He works in parallel computing, uh, parallel code development, and he is a fellow of AAAS and IEEE. Todd Triangan is the third speaker today. He is an assistant professor at Rice University and he is working on, in general, in bioinformatics problems. And he will be talking today about a certain component of this research. So the three of them are actually covering very different parts of the research team. So this is truly a kind of convergence research effort. So I'm going to stop sharing and allow Nancy to take over. Nancy? Thank you, Tandy. Um, Todd, do you want to go ahead and start presenting? Great. Please, so, um, hold on, hold on. Presentation mode, good. We're ready? Yep. Well, thank you, Tandy, for the introduction. Um, and you did a great job of, of kind of highlighting the very, um, the different expertise of the members of our team. Um, why don't we go to the next slide, Todd? Um, and the next one. So this team, as kind of Tandy also hinted a bit, um, brings together people with different expertise in bioinformatics, um, computational biology, parallel and high performance computing, and we're all trying to find the right way to use AI uh, methods to solve these problems. So let's go on to the next slide. So the project name that we gave ourselves is Project Covariance. Um, um, the three of us are the three co-investigators. And one of the major goals of our project is to try to develop new techniques and better techniques to aid the COVID-19 detection and transmission tracing. The way that we are working towards doing that is to look um, to study the um, evolution and transmission of what, so, what are so-called um, low frequency variants of the COVID-19 genome. Um, we will plan to use bioinformatics techniques, starting with existing techniques to understand what their strengths and weaknesses are, and then to develop new versions of those that we can use to look at um, variants that are within a, in a, an individual, an infected individual, and within populations. We'll be using um, new techniques that we are developing in this project um, related to parallelism and graph algorithms. Let's go on to the next slide. This is the outline of what we'll talk about today. We'll start off with the introduction, what we just covered. Um, and next we will talk a little bit more about what are actually these variants, these low frequency variants that we're looking at. Why are they important? How can we detect them? And what kind of inter-host variants have we been able to observe so far? 
Next, we will talk about um, the current techniques that we have and what, is the, what are the challenges to scaling them to large data sets. So we'll talk about like, what are we trying to compute and how can we speed it up? And if, essentially there are kind of two ways that we'll, we're considering doing that. One is to improve the computation itself so we actually have to compute less. And the other is how can we compute what we are trying to compute faster? And for that, we'll be looking into using parallel methods. And finally, we'll finish up and discuss a little bit about what we're kind of looking for towards the future, and we'll take questions. All right, um, next. And now we'll pass, I'll pass the baton to Todd. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Nancy. And I'm going to now get in a little bit more on the topic of what are the SARS-CoV-2 intrahost variants that Nancy mentioned. So this will be the second part of the talk. Um, so what we have here in, in the goal of this project is we really want to track low frequency variation to better understand intrahost population dynamics. And, and what I mean by that is pictured on the, the left here is we have two individuals, one that would be considered a donor, um, someone infected with COVID-19 and someone uh, on the right being a recipient. And so this, this illustration, what it's showing is that um, within, if we, if we were to peek inside of a person, and this is the animation that's currently showing, um, when this person becomes infected with SARS-CoV-2, uh, what happens is the virus begins to create a lot of copies of itself through the, the host uh, machinery. So the virus is inside the person and what we see on the right is kind of a illustration of kind of what the process is like here. And so we start off with a single copy or a few copies of the virus and rapidly throughout the progression uh, of, of, of onset of, of COVID-19, you get this population of, of viruses actually that grow within, within a single person. So if we were to freeze this at a specific point here, and we're gonna freeze it, let's say right now, uh, when we stop, we hit pause. So what's going on specifically within this individual who just uh, received or you know, was came down with COVID-19? So these stars represent individual copies of the virus virions within this population of viruses that now inhabit this person's body who is infected with COVID-19. And the stars here represent maybe uh, individual differences inside of this population that we would like to track. Okay, so this is this is what I mean and what we mean moving forward when we talk about intra-host variation. It's within this population of many tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of copies of these individual cells. Uh, uh, what we want to know what's going on, maybe what, in a handful of them. Um, so and and represented by these stars here. So and and kind of backing up away from this cartoon that I just showed. Here's the actual an actual image of what I just described, and what we see in this image is is particles of SARS-CoV-2 in yellow, they're artificially co colored. And this is isolated from the first person in the United States to have known to have COVID-19. So these uh, circles, the arrow is pointing to one of these is actually the variant I was just talking about. And this is with inside of someone who uh, uh, contracted COVID-19. So again, uh, in, in this real image, uh, the goal is to maybe understand how all of these individual variant par particles differ through looking at their genome. Okay, and that is that is the goal and what we're working on. Um, so specifically, again, getting back to now a more of a cartoon. Um, this is again, I mentioned the term genome. What is that? So let's just think of that as a sequence of A, G, C's, and T's. And, and in the case of an RNA virus, you replace the T's with a U. But for the purposes of this talk, we'll just we'll, we're going to deal with A, G, C's, and T's. Okay, so we have this um, on the left, this sample, the sample we just saw in the previous slide. It's a, a within host population of SARS-CoV-2. And then if we were to actually hand this over to a, a sequencing machine, what we would get is kind of what we see on the right. So we have the black boxes, which represent individual sequenced reads from that population. So the characters CGAT, CGAT, this is one sequence read perhaps from this population. And if we were to sequence uh, very deeply in an in, in individual sample, and the sample could be a swab from your uh, nose from your mouth, et cetera. So we swab that, we, we, we extract uh, the RNA and we, we sequence it, we get off what we see on the right. And, and so we get these black boxes which represent the reads. And if we line them all up uh, by, uh, by just looking at them and, and, and seeing how they uh, kind of compare and align it to this reference here, uh, we can start 
understanding this concept of what a consensus sequence versus uh, the variance again would be. So again, if we were able to have a, a method that could just take each of those uh, black rectangles and uh, map it to, to uh, a previous previously known SARS-CoV-2 genome, we would get kind of what we see here. So we see some columns um, here uh, correspond to what we see at the top. And, and this top part would be kind of the consensus or collective information that is what contained inside of that population. Um, and, and that's not what we're, what we're going after in this study. The study is really, again, about the lower frequency events. So if we go back to the star that we saw in the earlier slide, uh, the star is tracking a C change in this column. Uh, so a, a, a C in red, a C in red, and we see above it, there's a G and a G, and, and maybe in that position, uh, the consensus is a G. So we're really after these low frequency changes inside of this population of SARS-CoV-2 after, after um, it enters a, a host. So, so, okay, so now that we establish what inter-host uh, variation is, let's, let's go back, kind of step back again. So SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded RNA virus okay so i said like i said it's it's actually it's it's aguc instead of a t there and again what i just said there's consensus uh mutations which happen at the consensus level so if we were to look at all of the reads inside of a individual and we say what is the consensus or majority information for a given position across this thirty thousand base pair genome what is it um so that's what we show uh, on the bottom left here. But, but again, as I mentioned, we're interested in the lower frequency information, what would be below that consensus level or below the majority of the individual DNA sequence reads inside of that population. So, so again, consensus information is good for uh, uh, genomic diversity. It's computationally easy to extract uh, low levels of noise in the data when you're doing looking at the consensus level. Uh, but inter-host variation, um, it's uh, you kind of have the full information on the genomic diversity of the virus, given again, it's a population level analysis. And however, this is computationally expensive to extract uh, and the data can be noisy. So, so again, we're gonna try to, we're gonna discuss today tools that we can use to get out low frequency information uh, accurately and efficiently. So, so why are these important? Um, this is the next uh, part that I wanted to, to discuss. So if we go back, I always like to historically, let's talk about historically, why is this important? So if we go back 17 years, essentially, uh, we, there's a paper published in Nature called SARS, beginning to understand a new virus, okay? And so if you see on the bottom of your slides here, uh, uh, quotes from this, uh, from this paper, uh, and I'm summarizing, uh, essentially saying a new infectious disease arrived, uh, resulted in 8,000 cases and tragically 774 deaths across 29 countries. And the other note there from 17 years ago, one of the possible vaccine targets is the spike protein. Um, it was representing the most promising one. And so, so this is historical perspective. Some of the initial notes that came out after the arrival of SARS-CoV-1. Um, and if we look at what we have today, um, uh, we actually have this uh, tragic picture where we have 56 million uh, global cases. We have global deaths of 1.3 million. And, um, and I only show this to say, uh, both of these viruses are very similar uh, through their genomes, uh, but vastly different outcomes in terms of the effects on the global population. And again, we really want to look into and see if we can find any specific differences uh, at the low frequency level that could help contribute to understanding on why this is the case. And to put a finer point on this, we have this uh, image from a paper which is listed at the bottom where we're comparing the SARS-CoV-2 genome to the SARS-CoV-1 genome. And how you read this plot is essentially uh, each of these colored rectangles represent a annotated functional region of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Uh, so you have the blue, uh, which are non-structural proteins. Uh, you have the red, which are structural proteins, structure such as spike protein, et cetera. And then you have accessory factors in kind of the, the bottom right. Uh, those are colored in, in green. So essentially what we see is across the majority of the genome, there's very high levels of similarity. Um, and for the accessory factors here in the bottom right, uh, we see uh, a, a several regions that, that look a lot different. So that might be a clue as to which regions might be contributing to the uh, increased infectivity uh, or ability of it to get transmitted and cause wreak such havoc on the global population. So, so, 
summarizing this, um, there's kind of three cases when we look at SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. You have kind of identical, you have regions in both of their genomes across the 30,000 base pair coronavirus genomes, which are essentially 100% identical. If you were to look at every single uh, nucleotide across those genomes, uh, they would be identical. Then you see a case of the diverse, you see a non-structural protein and a structural protein um, that are uh, not quite identical, but fairly similar. So 86% of the positions in those regions would be similar. And then you have cases where there essentially is a huge difference where in this ORF8, uh, which was visualized in the previous slide, it's less than 50% uh, similar. So again, when we're trying to think about this project, it's through the lens of what do we know about coronaviruses? What do we know about SARS-CoV-1? And what can we learn about SARS-CoV-2? Okay, so again, why, why do we care about variants? So well, one really important mutation that's been discovered since the onset of the uh, COVID pan pandemic is the D1614G mutation. And this is uh, the image in the slide is occurring where uh, it's indicating where it's occurring. And it's a 16, 614th amino acid in the spike protein. And it changed from uh, D to G. So the amino acid changed from D to G. Okay. And again, so that's, we, we th there's this important change and I'll highlight that in a second. And then also we want to understand transmission. So again, going back to the illustration I showed earlier, uh, we can look at the low frequency information and the variant information to understand transmission. Um, and the last part, uh, why we care about these is actually for molecular tests and diagnostics. Uh, mutations and variation can actually result in false negatives. Okay, so uh, changes in the genome could result uh, in our tests failing to detect the presence of SARS-CoV-2. So these are the three primary re reasons why we care about variants, but put in a finer point on this, going back to the mutation I mentioned. So this is a change inside of the genome that wasn't, if we go back in time to January and February, that wasn't really prevalent across all of the global population. This is at less than, let's say 5% or less. Um, and somewhere around February, uh, this mutation uh, took hold and we found it across all of the genomes across the entire globe. So again, another reason why you wanna study these variant uh, variations and these changes inside of the genome is maybe you can find, uh, detect these changes before they uh, spread and try to help uh, understand potential uh, increases in uh, transmissibility, uh, infectivity, uh, and really understand how the genome is changing over time. So another recent reason why we care is for those that have been following the news, there's, uh, there's now a lot of uh, talk about rapid risk assessment of the detection of SARS-CoV-2 uh, related to the mink. So I'm not going to go into this. I don't have time today, but uh, pretty uh, recent uh, this in the last week uh, assessment of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infecting minks and then creating a lot of variation in the genome that, that we want to understand and, and dig into. Okay, so in summary, why do we care? Uh, we want to better understand infectivity, transmission, how the virus copies itself, replication and evolution. We want to divine, uh, design better diagnostics to reduce false negatives um, and, and to assess impact on vaccines. As the virus mutates, vaccines can become less effective. So those are the three main reasons. So I've defined now what they are and why we care about them. Okay, so the next thing that we wanna say is now we know what they are and why we care about them is how do we, how do we detect them? Okay, so let's zoom in on how we detect them. So I mentioned this concept earlier in the presentation. Essentially the step one is, remember the black boxes I mentioned, well now in this picture, uh, which is called an IGV plot and uh, uh, we have these red and blue boxes. And essentially these represent the the sequenced reads that come off the sequencing device that we're, we're using to get a readout of the virus inside of a population. So we're gonna take all of those sequences and we're going to align them or map them to the 30,000 base pair reference, okay? So we take the Wuhan uh, University reference genome uh, and we take all of the DNA sequence reads, which can be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions, tens of millions, and we map them back to that reference, okay? So that's step one in how we find variation is we wanna take these 100 to 150 uh, nucleotide 150 character long strings that we get from the DNA sequencer and map them back to the reference. The next thing we do is we want to zoom in. So after we map them, we get we can look at the actual alignment. So how do the AGCs and Ts uh, align or or look like compared? What do they look like compared to the reference? And inside this plot, we see a bunch of AGCs and Ts, and the reference is at the top, the top row in this picture. And we see if we look across this region of the this SARS-CoV-2 sample. Uh, we see that there's, it's highly similar, but there are regions where it differs. And so 
uh, we can start seeing that, okay, well, we see some differences and we see a lot of similarity, but how do we pull out the columns in this case that are different? So essentially, if we just hide the things that are similar uh, and only look at the things that are different, we see that overall, we see some T's and G's and C's that are different. And we see some gaps here uh, that we won't really discuss today, but we see some differences. And these differences in this plot are examples of things that we want to highlight and dig into in this project. So the main computational challenge that we're looking into uh, and, and trying to build off of prior work is understanding, is this, is this C in this picture inside of that column I just discussed, is it a true variation or is it a sequencing error? Meaning, is it one of the variants that I discussed that we care about to help with the three, three main goals? Or is this, um, is this an error uh, from, from the sequ DNA sequencer? And, and, and what I, uh, specifically what I mean by that is sequencing error rates vary between technologies. And so we could actually get that C to occur in this column of Gs just by an error produced by the mechanism at which we read, uh, read the SARS-CoV-2 genome, or this could be something that's very important for understanding the biology and transmission. So the method, the method that we uh, employ uh, in this project is a method called LowFreak, and it's a well-received method that has uh, been cited hundreds of times. Uh, and and it's widely used by the community and it actually uh, solves, it was designed to solve this exact problem is given a set of reads mapped to a genome uh, from viruses or et cetera, it's pull out low frequency uh, variation, okay? So exactly what, if we, if we were to peel back and look behind the scenes what low freak is and what it does, here's an illustration that kind of summarizes it, okay? So we have a read mapping again on the left uh, and then we have something, this concept of base quality. Okay, so essentially let's let's break this, this image down a little bit. So we have a reference sequence on the top, A, G, C, and T. We have reads, which are numbered one through N on the below that reference sequence. And then we have a quality score associated with each base pair inside of that matrix. If you're considering the top, the positions of one to 30,000 in the reference genome, and then, and then each row representing a read, uh, so we want to each one each cell in this kind of matrix is, will have a, a quality score, and that quality score is derived on on, on the right. So the sequencing uh, the sequencers will output a quality score Q for every position and every read, which gives you the probability that base is incorrect. So essentially, uh, we use this information to say if the sequencer is very confident that uh, that C in that column that I'm highlighting it should be a C, we're going to use that information to help. Uh, call variation. And if it's not very confident, uh, then we can also use that information to help uh, understand if and, and predict whether it's a low frequency variant or calculate if it's a low frequency variant or not. So high level, that's what it's doing. We, we have we have the, the lined reads, we have the quality information. Now we have everything we need to actually understand and, and calculate if this is, is a true variant or a sequencing error. So specifically, how does this work? Okay, so here's some details on how it works. And again, the question is how to decide whether the C's in this column that I've highlighted are sequencing error. So the notation here is K equals the number of bases different from the reference and is the number of mapped reads for the column. And if I sub I is the error probability for read I, um, and this is going from to, to one to the total number of reads. Okay, so the hypothesis that's being tested here is there are uh, K deviant bases uh, are just sequencing error or, or uh, alternatively, it's an actual variant in the sample. So a p-value here uh, that we'd calculate is the probability of having great k, uh, greater than or equal to k errors among n bases with error probabilities, uh, pi, pi sub i, okay? So in this case that I have highlighted, if you were to compute that out, you would get that this is a likely variant because the p-value is fairly low. And so we look at it and we think that the c uh, in this column are actual uh, uh, true, true variation instead of a sequencing error. So if we go to the next column, um, we don't see any variance present. So the calculation would be uh, just yield that. And then if we go to the next column, uh, we see our p value is, is, is increasing. So uh, we're less confident that this is a variant and more likely representative of a sequencing error. And you can, the idea is you go through all of the columns and you create this computation. Uh, and this is what low freak is doing behind the scenes. Okay, so low freak will tease out again in summary, is this true variation or a sequencing error using base quality scores and alignment quality and mapping quality, okay? So, so high level, that's what's going on. So, so kind of just, just, just moving on from this, what, what 
uh, intra-host variants have, have been observed. And so I was involved on this uh, study that's on uh, by your archive as a preprint and it's titled Hidden Genomic Diversity of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and inside this paper, we took a look. So we uh, had 151 patient samples from New York City and Houston. Um, and we also had some SARS-CoV-1 genomes and MERS uh, coronavirus genomes and we wanted to take a look. So specifically here in this slide, what we're showing are uh, the SARS-CoV-2 samples and kind of the salmon color compared to the purple is New York City, uh, the frequency of certain variants that were observed. And on the x-axis, it's the frequency of the variant. So uh, two would mean 2% of, uh, uh, so of the reads in a given column contain that C that we just saw. Um, and if you go up to 50, it would be 50% of the reads would contain that C. And then, uh, and then this is on the y-axis, you're just seeing the fraction of uh, intra-host variants that, that look like that. So what we see is for the Houston and New York City samples for this uh, experimental data, they, they closely track with each other, where we do observe some diff interesting differences at the within-host variant analyses between SARS-CoV-1, as I mentioned earlier on, this this might be an area of interest, okay? And then specifically, if we look at A to T, A to C, A to G, C to T changes, we can see additional patterns start to emerge for the within-host variants that I started uh, talking about at the beginning of my uh, section. So notably here, just call it one in the interest of time, uh, C to T changes that we saw um, within Houston and New York compared to, uh, in, so this, these would be consensus level changes, uh, C to T versus intra-host variant C to T. We see a, a drastic decrease in C to T changes um, um, for Houston and New York, New York City C to T changes. So this could be a potential interesting area to to dig into further to understand the biology of what's going on. Okay, and then just uh, similarly, you can keep going through these types of plots and start to understand uh, the mutational landscape of SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, compare and contrast and try to see what's going on behind the scenes. Okay, and that's this, this figure here is just summarizing what I just mentioned in the prior slides. So with that, um, I am going to now, we do a part three, and at this part, I would like to hand it over to Lawrence to discuss, can we scale current approaches to large data sets? Uh, so we, if we co collect the information about how many are, um, Hmm. One second. Okay. Let's to start your video. Okay. Okay. So if we ask, you know, how many times this uh, this occurs, you know, how big how big the data becomes from everything that we collect, and we collect more and more then we can see actually that the amount of data, the number of genomes that we are actually collecting is increasing, I would say, dramatically, maybe unfortunately, but dramatically. It's on. Again, it's not on. Uh, I'm sorry, the video is, seems to be going away. Uh, the the uh, and if what what happens is that if you look at the number of genomes in the GIS uh, eight database, it grows, and we are now actually in November. So this is just across months. So uh, just a few months, it goes up to two hundred thousand, right? And then here we are going to um, uh, terabytes, right? So we are. Uh, the, the amount of data that is collected so far is 10 terabytes. It's going to continue to grow quite significantly. And if you look at the amount of um, hours that it takes to analyze these things, it's going to, um, it's, it's going to, to um, increase dramatically, right? And it is actually linear in the number of mapped bases, right? And the process time, it increases. So it's really a linear relation. The slope is actually pretty significant, right? I mean, it's close to 45. So 
we it, it it's fairly obvious right that we have 200,000 genomes and counting sequence read you know in 10 terabytes so it, it kind of frames the problem right each position has 30,000 uh, positions and has been read so far 300 million times and then this is a fairly large data that has that promises actually to uh, increase as we go on so what can we do to actually um, improve on this thing i mean to try to actually um well next slide please okay so what can we do to compute and how can we speed it up and it is important to speed it up because we want to the result in actionable time we don't want it next year right we want it very soon so next slide so we try to actually map the entire program um, into a more, if you want, computationally understandable form of, of, of example, maybe a, a form that computer scientists understand a little bit better and can actually uh, accelerate. So basically what the algorithm that we are looking at, right, is a very simple way of viewing it, it is that we have the, as an input, there are n sequences, the reads, right, aligned with the consensus sequence R, and the output are basis and positions that are variants of R. Each position of a base in R, you know, for each position of it, we are actually performing a Bernoulli trial and the return for it, you know, a Boolean that it is it's, it's, you know, it's, it's answers yes or no, basically. And the Bernoulli trial in itself is computing the p-value of a Poisson binomial distribution. That's how we chose to model it. And if the p-value is smaller than the cutoff, then we return true, right? That means that a variant, an SNV, is actually found. And if not, not. So that's actually fairly simple. Well, from top, viewed from the top. So two main avenues to optimize this computation. We compute less, try to compute less. So it's a very high level, you know, the algorithmic level, right? To reduce the cost of the Bernoulli trial in this particular situation and compute faster. How can we compute faster? There are various avenues, but the one that is really scalable is to parallelize the computation because we have plenty of computers and plenty of uh, computational power. So we can just linearly increase them. So our current work, which took first a cut at both, right? We tried both, uh, shows quite a bit of potential. So next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, Lawrence. I think this is the, this is the next slide. This is 49. Um, I can okay. Move yeah. Sorry. So in the low freak, so we have this n sequences. So here is one way to actually compute less. So in in what you've seen before, the code that you have seen, the pseudo code that you have seen before, we have the boolean, right? That this is the the main, if you want, activity. So here the Bernoulli trial has to be accelerated. So what we do is that we approximate the p-value, right? And if it is larger than the threshold, then there is no variant. How do we do that, right? So we added a fast approximate computation of this Bernoulli trial. So we compute actually an approximate um, distribution that is a, it's a conservative approximate distribution. And then we can decide from there whether or not we want to compute even you know, more, or we can just uh, back off of it and draw a conclusion from it. Next. Okay, so um, I will. So, so Lawrence, I think it's, should I? You, I'll take yeah, over yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Go yep. ahead. So um, essentially, what what uh, Lawrence was saying now, and and I'll just do a little bit deeper dive here. The idea is how do we take this expensive recursion with nested loops that results into upwards of three hundred or four hundred CPU hours compute per sample, and we want to. We want to. We now want to look at maybe hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of samples, um, and instead of doing 
performing millions or tens of millions of hours of compute, you would like to compute less, as, as, as Lawrence said. So one way of doing this, we have papers on the bottom of our screen, which gives us some facts, fast uh, approximations. And so instead of doing this expensive recursion, uh, we can do approximation with a bounded error. Um, and so uh, what, what the strategy we're going to use now is we'll, we'll just kind of uh, discussed in, in a sense. So, so it's based on this Poisson binom binomial distribution. Okay, so I'll just advance. And the idea is here, um, if our, P, and as Lawrence mentioned, if our p value is larger than some pre specified confidence level, uh, we don't consider a base variant. So we can use this information to help compute less. We can use this to kind of uh, terminate the expensive commute before we kind of spend a lot of time if we're looking at this distribution inside of the figure. Uh, we have a column. Remember, we're competing in all the columns. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, calculate, calculate an approximation, uh, which uh, to determine when the p-value falls under a cutoff plus a small value. Okay, And if it does, we'll perform the expensive exact calculation. And, and, and uh, otherwise, uh, we're confident um, that the base is not a variant. Um, so, so here uh, we have our uh, the high level of, of the approximation and, and, and how we're going to compute this. Um, and again, specifically, um, we used a Poisson binomial approximation to skip the exact calculation. So we're only going to do the exact calculation uh, when it's above this pre-specified threshold. This change required very little code uh, addition. So this is a, a, a surgical change to this very widely used code base. And then of course, it doesn't, we can't just speed things up without or reduce compute without uh, caring about the results. So we compare the output of the optimized low freak with the original version. Uh, and we observe zero differences across multiple input files, which is what we expected. So we're, we're calling all of the same within host intra host variation and at a fraction of the time. So what do I mean by a fraction of the time? Well, here in this last slide of, of this section, we see the low freak speed up factor. So um, on the x-axis here, we have the input file size and the input file size corresponds to the number of reads inside of a given patient sample. Um, so approximately we have 100 and 843 uh, mega base pairs on, on the far left. And then on the far right, we have 26 billion base pairs on the far right. So 26 giga base pairs, I'm sorry. Um, and so in, in blue, uh, we have the exact compute and then in orange, we have the approximate com compute following what I mentioned. So um, essentially, we see that we've taken and we can speed this up by a factor of essentially 4x. Um, so specifically, um, uh, we, we can, in most cases, reduce the compute by half or by four times uh, less compute while preserving all of the information using this approximation that I just described. So these are excited preliminary results for our project and we're eager to continue on and look into further ways. So with that, I will uh, pass it now back over to Lawrence. Can somebody turn on my video? Okay. All right, so compute faster, do that, right? I mean, we said we compute less, that's always good. But in order to have, I mean, but we still have to compute something, right? So the, um, if you want the improvement in execution time will be, I wouldn't say modest, it's a few hundred percent, but not scalable to the data size. Next, please. So, the, we want to have a, a speed up, if you want, of the computation that is proportional to the data size. So the more genomes, the bigger the genome or whatever it is, the faster we want to compute so that we can actually uh, get the result in uh, a reasonable amount of time, actually in enough time so that we can actually take some action based on that, whether it is research or it is actually to alarm some epidemiological issues and so forth. So how do we do that? Well, we parallelize it because in terms of parallel computers, there is uh, a large, uh, large amount out there and they can actually scale from four cores or eight cores on a laptop to uh, millions of cores if you want on a large machine. So we parallelize it. Now the computation for it, the, the good news is that for starters, the computation for each position in the sequence can be done completely independently. So this is what some people name embarrassingly parallel. Next slide, please. 
So there is actually nothing embarrassing about being a parallel, but that's besides the point. So here we can actually, I can show you that for a certain position in your genome, right, you have a bunch of reads and they can all actually be grouped together. They can all, all these actually can be grouped or separately and executed in parallel, right? So this is chunk because that's how the, the person who drew that, they decided to chunk a bunch of uh, positions together. They can be grouped by four, by eight or one by one, but up to 30,000 and they can be executed in parallel. Next, please. So what's next? Well, we compute, we said we can perform the Bernoulli trial, right, faster by using less computation. And you can compute it faster by parallelizing the computation. Uh, I want to uh, point out, uh, you know, to you that uh, on each uh, position, at each position, there are perhaps millions of reads, right, for each position. So we need also to consider parallelizing the Bernoulli trial computation. So on each position, the each column has to be parallelized or executed faster. And there is a lot of, there are a lot of possibilities out there, including ex using accelerators uh, and better algorithms to do so, or transforming the computation into some approximate uh, computation that can be afterwards parallelized very well. So this is something that we are actually looking at, into it right now. Next. So what's next? I think that I will give it Pass back it to, to Nancy, me. right? Yeah, so now we're um, wrapping up. And um, so that's kind of what we've been doing so far. And if we go to the next slide, Todd, um, here are just some of the kind of other directions that we're looking at currently and that we'll be able to make progress on soon, we hope. But first off is to look at other types of variants um, as well as to study both the intra-host, the, the variations or mutations that occur within an individual patient, as well as the variants or mutations that may occur, um, that may be inter-host that would be across different people and in different regions of the world, for example. Um, and as Lawrence just mentioned, we're looking into doing you know, kind of more sophisticated use of parallel computing and accelerators such as GPUs. And then we would like to also look at this and try to provide this as a better tool to look at the impact on, for example, on vaccines and diagnostics, as well as looking into, so far we haven't actually used any novel um, AI techniques in the computation, but there's, as we've talked about, a lot of data and there, we're getting more and more data all the time. So there will be many opportunities for using machine learning techniques going forward. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So now we just like to make sure that we acknowledge the rest of our team, which as you know, in, is in most case, as in most cases, do, did actually most of the work. So our team is truly a multidisciplinary team and a cross institutional team between the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and Rice University. Although um, as we've been working together these last few months, we've realized that we actually have a lot of um, cross ties. So like Lawrence and I came from Texas A&M, um, some of the other U Illinois people have ties to Texas and some of the people in Texas have ties to Illinois. So let us move to, we can sh share with you actually our group photo um, in the next slide. And this is, you know, the one of our group meetings. Actually, this was just last week, I believe. Um, and we were working through the project and you can see everyone named here. So I think we wanted to leave this up where we, where we could start to take some questions, but thank you for attending. And, you know, thanks for letting us share with you our you know, initial work on this project. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Nancy, Todd, Lawrence. So we do have lots of time for questions. So I'd like to encourage people, you can put the questions into the Q and A. Um, and right now there's nothing in the Q and A because there was one question and it got answered. Uh, so, Questions are encouraged, not just welcome. So let me get this started. Um, so this can go to any of the three of you. So are there other 
types of diseases where you think this kind of work uh, would actually be relevant, for example, uh, Ebola or something else? Hi, Danny. Yeah, that's uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, and I, I think I think absolutely. Uh, one thing that we didn't have time to cover is a lot of the concepts and the computational speed ups that that Lawrence covered, and some of the ideas that Nancy mentioned, absolutely can be brought back over to looking at uh, flu influenza genomes, uh, Ebola genomes, and really at what it, at its core, uh, it's really thinking about how any virus, not just SARS-CoV-2, which is a devastating pandemic, of course, but any virus uh, evolves and changes over time uh, within a host. So uh, it is absolutely interesting and can feed back into research in really any infectious disease where uh, uh, of interest. And so, uh, and a lot of the, the ideas and, the, and, and in fact, low freak is not, wasn't designed originally just for SARS-CoV-2. In fact, it was some of the earlier applications of it was precisely on Ebola and influenza genome. So absolutely. And it's something that we're uh, always thinking about is uh, not only do we want to help uh, push forward some of the research in this important field, but also uh, provide back to the broader community and specific to infectious disease research. So while we're waiting for another person from the audience to suggest a question, I do have another question to ask you. Sorry for hogging your, your attention. But um, how, how would this work in terms of clinical use? So for, for example, would a real-time analysis be possible? And if so, what would that mean for treatment? Any comments? I think Lawrence, maybe you don't have your mute, um, mic unmuted. Lawrence is muted. Yeah, I You're have muted. to unmute myself, sorry. So yeah, I think that um, real time is actually important, the real time answer. And the question is, what is real time? What is real time for us? And it is basically to obtain actionable intelligence. As you can saw before, uh, if you just are not careful, a computation of such a variation or whatever, it's probably at least hundreds of hours of CPU hours, right? Hundreds of CPU hours, which is, might be actually make it too slow to do anything about it. So we want to act, and, and that is only a small computation, a part of the computation of what would actually let us do something about it. So uh, doing it fast is extremely important. And so accelerating the entire uh, process as much as we can, well, up to a certain point, right? It's also a matter of cost, uh, is, is crucial. And I think that uh, given that it is fairly paralyzable, we can employ a lot of resources and get it to where we need to be. Great, uh, there are more questions in the q and I'm gonna uh, read uh, them in turn. So there's two from Cyril. Uh, one says, following up on this question, any suggestions on how to tackle the problem of lack of data for health related research? And a continued part of that question, such as for COVID, there's plenty from US and big countries, but when it gets to small countries, it is hard to acquire data. So this is basically how do you deal with lack of data um, for, for this particular problem and in general for health related research. Todd, this might be something for you or Nancy. Um, Nancy, I can start and then if you wanna jump in, if, if that sounds good. Okay, um, and that's a great question. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, one of the things that maybe uh, we could have emphasized a little bit more is one, one real big benefit we're working with on this project is we have this data deluge. We have, uh, as Lawrence mentioned, over 200,000 genomes were having rich data sets and actually good geographic distribution. Uh, but there are certain regions of the world where uh, we would like, it would be beneficial to get more sequences. And importantly, for other infectious diseases, uh, some of the advances likely have been hindered by the just lack of available data. So um, computationally, uh, I, I don't have a, a, any like super specific answers, there are ways you can handle, but, but broadly how I've thought about this problem uh, uh, is uh, you have to encourage uh, and, and figure out ways to get sequencers out in the field and help lower the cost. And, and specifically in the case of uh, a lot of great work done in Ebola virus research where they've gotten handheld Oxford nanopore sequencers out in, out in the field and delivering data for low cost. And this has really helped advance and understand disease progression in countries that maybe traditionally haven't had as good as access to the data, but, but great question and, and happy to, to follow up. And I don't know, um, Nancy, if you wanted to add anything, if not, we can move on. 
Nancy, do you want to add to that? Because there's another, there's more questions in the chat. Um, I think that's a good, good um, response. I mean, I think one thing is we, we definitely want to be aware of and think about the biases that we might be introducing in our methods and, and even our conclusions about things if we don't have representative data sets. So that, that is something, and you know, with the different error uh, testing rates and for example, data collection that we have, it's, it's widely varied all over the world, even around, around the US, we have greatly varied. So like here at the University of Illinois, we are doing massive testing of our campus community. So we actually have a much richer potential data set like from, from here than you would from someplace else. And we want to make sure that the strategies and the methods we develop are robust to that. Good, let me tell you the next question in the Q&A is uh, from Diane. It says, how dependent are these algorithms on the accuracy of the sequencing methods, if they are at all? So this is about sequencing technology. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think I can take that one and it's absolutely uh, dependent on them, okay? So I mentioned one of the sequencing technologies I just mentioned was Oxford Nanopore. And the exciting part of that is it's a handheld sequencing device, uh, the MinION, but uh, one of the drawbacks, and although they've made great progress in error rates, uh, for some of these sequence reads, which I mentioned early in the talk, uh, if you have a hundred base pair sequence, maybe the Illumina uh, sequencer would have less than one error for a hundred uh, nucleotides or characters. Uh, Oxford Nanopore could have 10 errors across that, that same hundred base pair stretch. So uh, when you're looking at calling low frequency uh, events or, or, or variants and trying to tease out differences between sequencing error and variance, as the error rate increases, uh, this produ obviously produces some additional challenges. Now, um, there are, uh, so we've, we've looked into this and others have looked into this, but you have to model the problem differently. You have to understand uh, fairly well uh, the, the error profile, uh, and there might be some additional sequencing strategies that would help you uh, mitigate this increased error rate. But, uh, but for the approaches we described in today's talk, you are high, you, you rely heavily on high fidelity sequencing that, that would have lower than 1% error per base read out uh, so that you can drill down deeply into the lower frequency variation information. So a great question. Okay, so there's a, there's a technical question in the Q&A that uh, Todd, I'll let you answer separately. But there's another question that came in um, on another venue that says, how do you envision machine learning impacting the computation and what would you do to counter potential bias? So in answering the question, could you tell us a little bit about the kinds of bias that would be uh, potentially creating problems for what you're doing and then how you would counter it? Did you want to- I don't know who's gonna Todd, answer that. Todd, are you gonna answer the question yeah, of I, bias? Um, yeah, um, about the, the machine, Nancy, I don't know if you have any initial thoughts and I'm happy to build on that if you have any thoughts on just how machine learning can impact. I mean, I've, I've, I've broad thoughts, but maybe, I don't know if there's anything you wanna tackle first, Nancy, on that one, or if not, I can take it. You can, you can start first and okay. I can okay. add sure. on. <laughs> sure, so um, yeah, so, so I, I think there's been some really interesting, and this is, this is on topic, uh, this is, there's a, there's a variant caller uh, that's had great success and it's called deep variant and it's it's solving a similar but not the same problem and this is developed by scientists at the broad institute and at google uh, and they've applied deep learning techniques to the problem of variant calling but this is specifically for uh, uh, human genomic data and the reason that's different is is there's a simplifying uh, factor there where we're essentially uh, understanding that they're they're a diploid genome meaning we have two haplotypes and so uh, but, but this is a great example of deep learning and machine learning uh, being uh, kind of coupled with uh, some of the techniques we described today in producing some really, really nice results. In fact, there is current benchmarking that just came out uh, that shows that this deep learning method is outperforming some of the traditional uh, bioinformatics methods. So that's, that's pretty exciting. I think that shows progress and potential for some of deep learning machine learning to this area. But then if we back up a second and go back to the problem that we're describing in today's talk, uh, this problem of understanding and pulling out variations inside of a population where we don't know the number of different viruses inside of a population, that, that makes it a much harder computational task. And I don't know if there's any clear path yet, not saying there wouldn't be, but yet on how we can 
use uh, kind of approaches similar to Ethereum, but apply them to, to this, this computational problem. So uh, I, I'm encouraged by methods like deep variant, but uh, I think there is certainly a lot of work left to be done in terms of thinking about modeling and training data sets and understanding the problem better before we can uh, apply certain current successful techniques back to this problem. Nancy, were you going to add to that? Um, not really, I don't think. I mean, I guess one of the things, the question was about biases, though. Um, so for that, I mean, we already mentioned a little bit the fact that, you know, just our uh, the, the way in which we collect our data sets and from where that can introduce bias. Um, other things that could impact that might be other things that we're not necessarily um, controlling for, were, which would be like mutations that are due to other things like co-infections or other environmental factors that aren't going to be uh, basically visible just from the data that we're collecting in our data sets. Um, and I guess uh, perhaps also due to the different technologies that are used to collect the data sets. So there are just a lot of, you know, even though if we develop um, algorithms, which themselves are all probabilistic, and remember each like of these, these reads are not, you know, 100% accurate. Each one of them is itself, you know, and basically an estimate with a certain, you know, confidence. And so these things, when we try to bring to, to federate all these the data from all these different data sets, that's another challenge to try to do that properly. Okay, um, Todd, you're going to answer that technical question directly. Uh, are there any other questions that anyone wants to ask? Well, in that case, let me thank you all very much for your enjoyable talk. I'm glad you guys are working together. Um, and uh, thank you to C3AI for having this colloquium series. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all. So Todd, do you see that?